double record. Double your freshness, double your fun. Oh, we love it. Two is better than one. Yes. Double meant uh, record. <laughs> hey. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Hello. Oh, my goodness. So uh, we had a really wild night last night. Yeah, we had fun. We got to go to UFC 298. Yes, it was a little a little sad for me. I mean, I was sad with the bulk. Yeah, that made me, that made me sad. I I kind of wondered how he would do coming off of such um, a, a bad knockout and then having such a quick turnaround. Yeah. That always, you know piques my interest and then um somebody like Taporia who's you know a beast a power puncher um and just a lot to handle in the octagon um I wasn't necessarily surprised but what's even crazier is he's asking for an immediate rematch yeah I love that but I'm not really surprised by that either because he's kind of a never gonna hang it up never gonna quit always ready for the next scrap kind of guy and it's a little different from his uh his kind of brother in Adesanya, where he lost that fight against Strickland, was kind of like, you know what? I need a break. <laughs> I need a mental reset. This is a bit much. My body hurts. My brain hurts. I just need to chill out for a second. And Volk is like, you can, you can, you know, he's hurting as he's saying these words, but he's just like, I'll do the rematch. <laughs> Please give me the rematch. He's kind of addicted, you know, to the fight game. And that's how most of us are. We're addicted to fighting, addicted to uh, the thrill of it. Okay. Well, people yes. chase <laughs> the high almost, you know, almost, I, I don't want to say like an addict, but it you cannot imagine the high that one feels after winning a fight, let alone winning a title. Oh, my God. Um, and then the lows. I want to imagine it. Are, are the, the lowest, <laughs> the lowest thing you can possibly imagine. So mm. it's just this roller coaster, and you're constantly trying to, to, to chase it, to achieve it. And so I understand why he would want to get back in there, but I really think he, that he should take a, a page from Adesanya's book. And, you know, hopefully his team can sit down with him and just say, like, hey, maybe you need a break. It was interesting watching, um, uh, what, what's his, uh, Eugene? Eugene and uh, Craig Jones, I think, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of chatting before they were allowed into the cage. They were just standing by the door and chatting. They were facing right towards us. And I was trying to imagine what they were saying yeah. because it looked like they already saw the white writing on the wall before it happened. I know whenever you're cornering someone, you always think about the best case and the worst case. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the worst case, but I feel like they had already mentally prepared for it by the way they were standing and chatting and kind of discussing, seemed like discussing what happened before they were allowed into the cage to check on their fighter. Um, and it was a very calm thing. So I feel like uh, this gym is probably going to get a lot of slack and a lot of um, negativity thrown at it just because of the few losses that they've had on a big scale. But I felt like they were handling it in the right way. They were prepared for that outcome. And, you know, you can only protect your fighter for as much as they're willing to let you protect them. He's not going to turn down this big opportunity, even if he just got knocked out, even if he might have gotten hurt in training. Or, you know, when you have a concussion, it takes a long time for that to heal and a long time for you not to react as much to a hard shot. Your chin never really recovers. So it was a really quick turnaround, and I feel like the the body language of the coaches kind of told me that they knew this was a big possibility. Sure. I mean, they, they're a really well-prepared gym. They're uh, very savvy. They're very in the know with, you know, technique, reading people, reading their fighters, reading opponents. Um, they, they've got to be aware that that was a huge risk and possibility. Um, the, the brain just, it wants to protect itself. And after such a devastating knockdown or knockout, so excuse me, um, it's it's no wonder that the brain wanted to protect itself again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not everyone's um, going to charge forward like Mackenzie Dern, <laughs> half concussed like a zombie. <laughs> well, also. <laughs> <laughs> and no, still that's... grabs a leg and, and somehow wrestle up to a good position. Like uh, people's brain usually shuts off when they get hit hard. And when it happens once, it's a lot easier for it to happen again. 
Sure. And I mean, she didn't have the best reaction initially. Um, I'm when she got, you know, popped in the, in the nose or in the eye, mm. when, you know, she got that bad cut. She didn't react very well, but it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, like a, a such a devastating blow that she was completely discombobulated. Mm -hmm. It was like, a, you know, spinning your head on a bat and trying to run to first base kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so she she ended up doing what, um, you know, what she's trained. Her uh, body kind of went into autopilot on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, you know, different scenario. And somebody like that hits as hard as to Corian Volkanovsky, that's going to have a, a much different reaction. Yeah, I, I just think the, the natural reaction is, I mean, not the natural reaction, but most people are going to drop like that after getting hurt, you know? And, um, yeah, it's just, it just sucks that he had to go up against uh, such a hard hitter like Taporia. Like, that guy has been knocking out everyone. Only person he didn't knock out was Josh Emmett, who's another one who just has a head made of rock, and he will wobble his way back into the fight. And, you know, not everyone has that uh, gift, I guess, that thick head. Yeah, I did see, um, you know, the, our coaches talk a lot about, you know, the follow-up. You're not just looking for that one punch. It's important to throw a combination. Maybe it doesn't necessarily land well, but then you follow up, you follow up again. So kind of staggering and uh, staggering the attacks. And that's what I saw last night with Saporia. He didn't necessarily catch him solid but his second attack is is what ended up finishing him and dropping him ultimately mm -hmm. so it was um it was you know a little mental mental and I was like oh that's what that's what that's why that's why we do that that's, that's what, what it looks he was like talking about <laughs> yeah it was similar to the Emmett fight where he was able to just find that angle that like right over the shoulder angle um when someone's long here and able to jump in and out he was able to just kind of pop 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 out and then come back in right over the shoulder it's almost like your shoulder is blocking your vision of where that punch is going to come from and uh it's really crazy when someone's able to land it on you because it's one of those punches you don't see it just sneaks right in that tiny little hole that's open and Taporia does that with everyone he he's stands and trades with and it's really crazy that he kind of came in as a submission artist coming into the UFC he was a submission artist all the way up until he got there and then he just started knocking people out I feel like he found his little spaces that he can get over on people and maybe just the fact that they were so prepared for his ground game they leave even bigger holes for them to kind of get into his punches can just sneak in there and catch you on the chin when you're worried about something else. Yeah, I've got to say, um, I didn't exactly pick up on everybody in the crowd that was dressed in black with red roses, but it was a really nice touch at the end. So I didn't see that. There were people to, to the right of us where we were sitting facing the octagon, and they were all dressed up. And at first I thought they were, you know, I don't know, maybe they were with somebody else or I, I didn't quite get it, but it all made sense at the end when everybody was rushing in and everybody's wearing all black and roses. It was kind of it was kind of cool. I've never really seen a, a family or a crew do that before. Huh. Yeah. W was it his family? Yeah. Oh, OK. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if uh, the old man Volk people were just his cousins? Like Volkanovski's <laughs> cousins, they all got that old man outfit and came to UFC to watch him win, and then they all got to hobble in <laughs> with it their would. walkers. It would have been like an episode of Greece or the Warriors, you know, everybody in their like oh uh, yeah, and their crews. <laughs> I would have loved that. Parting the ways. <laughs> what would you call the Volk gang, the old man Volk gang? Oh man, the geezers. Oh. Yes. Yeah, something like that. And then uh, Taporia be what? The Matadors. Oh, yeah, of obviously. Course. Obviously, the Matadors. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. We got to do that next time. If they get the rematch, definitely do that. Have a bunch of cosplayers. <laughs> that would be really fun. No, it was it was a very unique energy. I hadn't, um, you know, I hadn't been to a fight in, I feel like, a really long time. Um, I was in the fight in Brazil, but it's just kind of different. Mm -hmm. It's just different. It's it's such a big arena at the Honda Center, so it well, was and really everyone cool spoke feel. English. That was different. So too. you got to join in, <laughs> join in different on the energy. jokes. Different yeah. energy, yeah. When they were chanting "cuck," <laughs> you knew what they were saying. You're like, "Oh, I know that word." <laughs> Man, speaking of that fight, um, I mean, 
Ian Gary, I thought, you know, maybe with a win, it would change people's perceptions, you know, kind of get them back on his side. But I don't think he did himself any favors with that one. I mean, he's just been winning. So win wouldn't change anything. I think uh, a loss maybe in a show of humility might up his um, standing with the fans, but he doesn't need it because he's undefeated. He has that. Um, he has knockouts on his record. He has this big push. Everyone wants to see him lose. So they're going to keep tuning in. He doesn't need fans on the side, but, uh, man, what a lame way to win. (laughs) It was not a pretty fight. He rode the bicycle the whole time. it, it, It is. And, you know, I don't think you would judge the average fighter is harshly if they didn't talk such a big game on the come up talking about how he's going to do this to the guy, do that to the guy. He's going to be the next, next biggest thing on the, in comparing himself to Conor McGregor on Conor McGregor's rise. He didn't run. He ran once he was famous, you know, once he, once he got the belt, that's when he ran. Yeah. That's normally, I mean, that happened with, you know, GSP. It happens with people. Mm -hmm. They want to keep that belt. They want to, you know, protect their legacy. So they start adapting their style to the safest and quickest route to victory. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, you know, you turn into to a, a bit of a runner. Um, and I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with that. But as to what you were saying, you know, coming and talking so there's big. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> 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 okay, Jess. No, I think my fighter, my fighter spirit, which has gotten me in trouble, which is why my record is not good compared to Ian Gary's. But the fighter spirit is what people like to see, what people like to get behind. They don't really care about your health as a fighter. No, <laughs> And I no. think Ian Gary was protecting his health because uh, Jeff Nill has hands still. He, he punches like a brick. So you can tell he was just playing it safe, doing just enough of what he could do. It, it reminded me of a Muay Thai fight. Where are you watching, like, Lumpany Stadium? These guys are fighting, but they have another fight in two days. Mm-hmm. So they're going to do just enough to win. Once they feel like they win, they start dancing. Hey! Yeah. The fourth, or is it the fifth round? The fourth or fifth round is always a... Uh, it's a dance-off. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's the last round. But then they do it. If they secure a round, they'll just kind of circle and make sure they're safe. And that's kind of what the second and third round was for Gary. The first round, I thought, was clearly nil. Mm. The second round, I'm, I'm not sure if it was the second round was Gary or the third, but there was one really close round and then one clear Gary round. Mm. And... uh you can tell in the second, he just started doing just what he needed to do and then getting out of the way of danger. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Nill was just kind of chasing him a lot. So you can't just blame Ian Gary. But I'm sure that wasn't the fight that Neil was prepared for. No, and if you're not preparing for that kind of fight, sometimes it is kind of a, a challenging adjustment. Yeah. Because you have these things that you've ingrained in you and your muscle memory and you're just ready for that. And so if it, it can be a challenge to kind of make that adjustment on the fly. The mental toughness of still playing that game when people are chanting cuck, though. That's pretty impressive. Cuck, 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 cuck. I was like, what are they saying? <laughs> Wait, what are they saying? Are they saying cock? Like cock a doodle <laughs> They weren't saying cock like that. Uh, maybe they were saying someone else's cock. <laughs> Somebody else. Um, we digress. But, uh, yeah, he played the game. I wouldn't be surprised if he fought that way just to piss off the fans. Who knows? Who like, knows I wouldn't be surprised. Were. I think he was trying to win, and he knew that he had, you know, a, a tough opponent who could, you know, possibly drop him and, and take him out of his win streak. But usually he throws all caution to the wind and just goes for it. He'll sure. get dropped. He'll come back. I know he's probably uh, working on playing it safer, but we've seen him get hurt and then come back and just kind of not give uh, a damn about what his opponent is doing, how strong his opponent is. Maybe this is the first guy he's actually respected outside of the previous fights when it comes to power. But I wouldn't be surprised if he was just like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, okay, all right. I'm going to still win this fight, but you're not going to be entertained. He can suck it. <laughs> <laughs> he might be cheeky like that. Who knows? He's definitely cheeky in a, pri- <laughs> in a uh, press conference like that. So who knows? 
Yes. Covering his tracks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, how cheeky was Marab in his fight? See, uh, there's a difference with like how Gary is cheeky, and then there is a difference how Marab is cheeky. He is a likable little little guy. He's a little scramp. He, <laughs> he's so likable. He can, you know, a scramp, a scamp. <laughs> He little can, scrambling scamp. He can, you know, neck at Henry Cejudo when he's got him in a headlock. He can, you know, pick him up and walk him across the octagon and, you know, people cheer. Some other some other people might think like, hey, that's poor form, bad taste. You're, um, you know, making somebody look bad or you're doing too much kind of thing. But everything he did I thought was adorable. How are you going to look like the bad guy when you're fighting Henry Cejudo? That is fair. I didn't specifically say Henry. I, I think, just said a person. I think Gary would look like the good guy fighting Henry Sejita. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I think he would. I think he would. He's he's a little newer. He has more flashy knockouts, so at least recently. So I think I think people would be on Gary's side before Sejita's. I don't know. Maybe it depends on where you're fighting, but they're both pretty bad guys. They they both play good hills. Yeah, but it's in a different way. Yeah. I, I think that uh, Suhudo is just so um, choreographed and, you know, wrestly. So who would you root for, Suhudo versus uh, Kobe? Oh, God. Oh, God. Um, I, oh, no. We don't need to do, do a it. bracket. Don't make me do it. We need to do an eight-man bracket of the most hated heels in MMA right now and see who ends up on the top. Man, just because I think, <laughs> just because Henry is a family guy, I, you know, I have to believe that there's some, there's some good redeeming qualities in him. So I would go for Henry against Colby. There are people who like him enough to not be paid. Exactly. <laughs> exactly <laughs> my <out> point. <laughs> for the hour. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought uh, I thought Marab was super fun to watch. He's just been really killing it with the social media stuff, too. And then you see him get out there and he's the same fighter. He's he's going out there. He's having fun with it. He's securing stuff. He's putting himself in danger. He did get wobbled a little bit in that fight. And we were like, oh, no, not our good guy. And then he comes back to pick up Cejudo and like drop him in front of Mark Zuckerberg and just go, ah, I'm going to choke him. Or I don't know what he was saying, but he was just like, Ah, and Zuckerberg was loving it. I felt like he was uh I forget his name, but the the like the prince and gladiator. Mm. The prince or the king and gladiator when he's waving his thumb in the air and yeah, then yeah. eventually he just went. <laughs> <laughs> so the only person he did that for because everyone else Dude, I feel like Zuckerberg is kind of like uh, Drake in the sense that he is like really taking fighters out with. He's uh, a new curse. He is. It's yeah. a real thing. Yeah. It was. Uh, what was it first? Dern. It was. Yeah, Dern. Um, he was in was Volk's it corner. Volk and was it Sudo or who was the other person? No, I don't remember. There was remember. a third person. Yeah, there were, he was in three people's corners. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember. Maybe the, not corners, but he was just like going for them. Yeah. yeah. And he posted pictures with them. I forget who the, the third one was, but the UFC was all over it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I swear he, it might have been, it might have been Henry. Yeah. yeah. You may be right. And of course, Marab being the guy that he was would be like, hey, you know, next time you come out with me, okay? You know? I know. Don't do it. It's not <laughs> worth it, Marab. Don't, it's don't not Marab. worth it. Don't I fall think for that. Marab could break the curse. He'll just do like one of his cool uh, traditional dances and, and break the curse that way. And Zuckerberg will be blessed and ready to corner him without ruining the fight. <laughs> <laughs> but Zuckerberg, he's gonna be the next curse. We have uh Drake curse, yeah, the Eminem curse, yeah, which freaked me out once because I fought a girl who walked out to Eminem and they switched our songs. They thought I wanted to walk out to Eminem, and I was so taken aback because I knew about the curse. Like Eminem's great, you know, I want to be my walkout choice, but. I like a little Eminem here and there, but I would never walk out to the song because of the curse as well, Mm -hmm. you know? And then they switched and I was like, oh no. Yeah. (laughs) But I think you have to actually pick it 
they someone can't curse you by accidentally exactly playing Eminem before. Yes. And then there's the Bruce Bus- Buffer uh, fist, fist bump. bump. Fist bump curse. So avoid all of those things if you have a fight coming up in the UFC. Don't do it, guys. It's not worth it. Avoid it. I used to be, you know what? I used to be really, really superstitious uh, oh, yeah. up until I got into the Ultimate Fighter house. And then I couldn't do any of my, like, weird rituals. Oh, so no. So that really, like, yeah, that really got rid of it. But for a long time, like, I mean, I think there are fighters who are still, like, you know, wear their lucky shorts. Yeah. Wear their lucky bra, you know, do do certain things. Like, there's all these, like, little checkpoints that you have to do. It kind of becomes, like, OCD. Mm-hmm. I have my uh, lucky walkout shirt that mm-hmm. I had from my Muay Thai days. I had, um, what else? I think that's it. Uh, I lost everything else. All my other superstitions I couldn't find anymore. But uh, that was the one thing. I would always bring my walkout shirt. I wouldn't even touch it. It would just be in my suitcase, but I knew it was nearby. And then the Tough House, they took it away. Mm. I'm like, I'm not even going to wear it. Just, yeah, just let me have it. Stop it. They took That's it away. No. Name. No logos. Oh, my God. No logos. They, they took wouldn't even Greek it for you? It was, the logo was pretty big. Didn't want to support Evolution Muay Thai. Losers. So rude. Look at them now. I wish they had. I know, right? Um, yeah, so uh, the co-main was pretty crazy, too. The co-main. Um, we had. Um, Whitaker and Costa. Yeah, Whitaker Costa. That was a pretty insane fight. A lot of people were kind of mad that they didn't get fight of the night. What were you thinking? I mean, I didn't think it was fight of the night. I think, honestly, there were. I think the ladies put on a really good fight. Um, I think that there, it was, it was up there, but it wasn't fighting a night for me for sure. Mm. Uh, I feel like when you think about, um, uh, momentum shifts, I think that's what you think about the most and how exciting they were and how close each person came to finishing the fight. Mm -hmm. And I do think the girls had more of those. So I, I feel like people always think it has to do with, I don't know skill or who was able to do more of everything and then who else was able to do more of everything but a lot of times it's just this is a really evenly matched fight and these two tried to murder each other they literally had no energy left at the end of it and i do think the girls uh hit those marks more than the co-main but the co-main i thought was just like really technical, really cool to watch, had moments for each fighter. And I was kind of impressed with Costa because was too. I, in his Luke Rockhold fight, I did not think he still had it. Like He's he's not shown up to, to some of his previous fights in ways that just look like he didn't take it seriously. He, mm. he just kind of, he's like, okay, I'm in the UFC now. Now I don't have to work harder. So like it, it, <laughs> should, it was the weirdest thing. He would, um, I just felt like he would come in and he maybe he was trying to like swing too hard and go for that like that big knockout and he would just kind of like uh not conserve his energy properly mm. and he would end up you know just um fading out and you know Adesanya made him look pretty bad so i think mm. that was like the most lasting thing in my mind well he took his uh his virgin hole <laughs> he did him dirty <laughs> <laughs> he did that guy dirty he took that thing mm. and it, i mean that was Super embarrassing, but I love the fact that he kind of turned that around and and created a persona after that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if he was funny before that, but he was definitely funny after. <laughs> no, he's yeah. like, uh, he, he's really just kind of embraced, mm-hmm. like, um, who Being he is. Being the butt of the joke. Uh, <laughs> no, he really has. And, I, and I, I like that about people. They can, you know, laugh at themselves, not mm. take themselves too seriously and just kind of go with it. And it takes its power away. Yeah. You know? It definitely, before he fought out of Sanya, it definitely seemed like he took himself a little too seriously. Um, and then he just kind of started doing the secret juice bits and really playing up things, talking talking shit about other fighters. And uh, not in a way that you're like, oh, he wants to fight him, but just like in a silly way that just makes you laugh at a situation. So, you know, yeah. Maybe after you get rode in the octagon and stuff like that, everything else, it just, you know, puts you, things into perspective. You it just lower your guard. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Literally lower your like, guard. Like, you know what? <laughs> It is what it is. It is. We're all just here trying to make each other entertained. 
<laughs> but he was super entertaining uh, last night. Um, that spinning wheel kick was insane. That was so unexpected. Like, where did that come like, from? And he did it again, too. Yeah. Like, what? Whitaker didn't see it. That thing came out. Of uh-uh. no- oh, what? Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know your body moved like that. Dude, it, it almost looked like um, Kevin Lee versus Barbosa. Remember that fight? Kevin Ooh. Lee came back and won in, in the same way, but he got hit with a nasty spinning heel kick to the face and did this little dance number right before getting his wits back about him and going in for, for the... For the um, wrestle fuck and the kicks and everything but yeah it was really similar Whitaker took it like a champ he was able to come back strong and then yeah it was a good fight I loved watching Whitaker's head movement I mean he's always been you know really good footwork and in and out but I swear like he was on like just on the end just by like centimeters of Costa's punches and it was just so impressive like his his timing his head movement footwork so impressive and um and then the ability to like re-engage after those punches. Mm-hmm. So impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It was super cool to watch. And it makes me feel like Whitaker still got it. You know, I saw um in his press conference, he wasn't really trying to call anyone out, but he's just like uh ready for whatever. He's always ready to fight, ready to show up, ready to do his job, and he always wants to make it entertaining. And that's what we saw. It was it was an awesome fight. Yeah, I think he's definitely one of my like top five favorite fighters. Aww. Just because, and he was talking about this in the press conference afterwards too. They were asking, you know, why, why do you think people like you so much, or why are you so likable? And I think that was just, our boy. Our boy asked that. Oh, did he? Who's yeah, our boy? Matt Davies. Oh. Yeah. good job, Matt. <laughs> no, it was it was um, it was a good question, and his response was even better. Because it's just like, you know, I am who I am. I show who I am. And and he's just authentically himself. And he knows that that resonates with people. And I think that, you know, that's what's frustrating to me about certain, you know, fighters like a Henry Cejudo, mm-hmm. where they just, you know, try to, or a Colby, or, you know, they're just trying so hard to be something that they're really not authentically. Yeah. And it gets really frustrating and really old. For sure. Um, also, I started liking Whitaker when he was in that Fallout commercial. For a video game, Fallout. Oh, I didn't see it. He's a Fallout fan. Oh. I like it. You're cool. (laughs) You're cool in my book. That's like my favorite video game. So (laughs) ever since then, I was a fan. Gotcha. I haven't seen it. Well, it's a video game. (laughs) Well, I know what Fallout is. But I just have never played played it. Never will. Um, Did you get to catch any other fights that... uh, tickled your fancy that you enjoyed no those were the ones that really stuck out i mean it was a really good main card it was it was and the prelims kind of delivered too they got the uh they got the crowd nice and warmed up um i i do want to talk about that uh junior tafa versus rogerio de lima fight that was pretty nasty too i got some inside scoop on that too while we were at the fan experience oh tell me more (laughs) no it wasn't really that big (laughs) that big of a deal but um you know hearing that uh what was his name tafa's opponent um uh Uh, de lima yeah jerry de lima yeah um so tafa his brother stepped in Mm -hmm. on short notice on like a day notice because the other big Big brother Tafa had yeah. to pull out. Justin. Justin uh, and Junior. Justin and Junior. <laughs> Which is easy to remember because Justin's a big one and Junior's the little Justin. He's a little one. <laughs> he it little, makes sense. They yeah. plan that well. <laughs> Good job. Good job, parents. <laughs> Such foresight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were just talking about how Marcus was going to turn it down. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? I d- don't know. Was he scared of little, little Junior Tafa? It was just the weirdest thing. Like that's, hmm. um, I mean, I feel like as a fighter taking another opponent on, on one day notice, even though he was, um, so this Tafa Jr. was preparing for a fight like eight weeks out. So he was, you know, kind of in shape, but he's not peak performance shape right now. And he's a lot smaller. Yeah. Not, not in this weight class technically. Mm. So it was just interesting to me that he initially didn't want to take it. And then the UFC had to come in and just, you know, entice him a little bit. Maybe he just wanted to be enticed. 
Maybe. Because I feel like that's happened a lot lately where, I mean, that's why Volk ended up fighting sure. um, Makachev on short notice. He was enticed. Mm. Not just for that fight, but for fights in the future. So maybe he was playing his, his cards a little like, you know, hey, I'm here. I'm in shape. We got an opponent, but I'm not excited about it. Why don't you make me a little more excited about it? Well, they basically said, listen, you'll get like put on the back end of the rotation if you don't take this fight. Nah, that was that's enticing. not enticing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the short notice guy got got properly enticed. Oh, OK, <laughs> well, that's not fun. Mm-mm. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what he saw that got him a little worried. I mean, Junior's fast. Maybe that's something that he wasn't prepared for. He was prepared for the bigger, like slower fighter. And when you're at light heavyweight and heavyweight and you're fighting a striker, I feel like it's not a huge difference. It's mm-hmm. more when you're fighting like the grapplers and wrestlers that if they get on top of you, you're going to feel that weight and it's going to suck. So maybe he just felt like the kid could be a little faster than him. He wouldn't be ready for the combinations as well as the ones that he prepared for because he doesn't have the, he doesn't have like a perfect record in the UFC, but he's a devastator when he looks good. So I could see him trying to play it safe, especially like at this point of his career. But didn't have to. Mm-mm. Went out there and chopped that leg down like a tree. Those calf kicks. Mm. I was telling you, I'm like, I just want to do that to someone so You can. Badly because I felt it before. So now I want to, you know, pay it forward. I want to give back. I'm a giver. So generous. Um, there were a lot of good calf kicks that night. Um, uh, the Limas were super nasty. Um, I was telling you, I warmed up and backstage with him when he, not with him, but when he was fighting next to him, it felt like I was warming up with him because the, the sonic boom of his kicks on the pads were shaking the room. Oof. He, he kicked so hard. He kicks stupid hard. And you can see the core underneath that belly. There's a lot of power there. There's a lot of power in his hips and in his core. But then also you saw some nasty kicks in the uh, in the Dern and Lemos fight. Lemos was chopping that like up nasty. Now, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about because a lot of people are kind of torn online on whether Lemos or Dern should have won that fight. And I was kind of surprised. Because we were watching it, and from what I saw, I thought it was clearly Lemos. But then when I thought back to the first round, I was like, oh, well, she did take her down halfway through, but it was all Lemos had just a little bit more control time. Like Lemos was winning up to the three minute mark, and then Dern won the last two minutes. So I was surprised that people were saying that, but then I kind of understood it. But I think. The people saying that didn't see how nasty her calf looked. Her calf looked like a bicep. In in those her shin looked like a bicep. No, it looked like it was flexing on yeah. Muscle Beach the whole time. Like it, it was, was it was pretty bad. I agree with the decision. Yeah. And I, I I didn't know how the judges would see it though. I hope that they saw it that way because I mean, I I look for consistency in the judging and now more consistently the consistency that I'm seeing is that the judges are going off of damage rather Mm. than like volume or, you know, control. They're, they're looking at damage more so now. So just based off of that in those, in the first three minutes of the opening round, Lemos like had more damage. She was butchering that calf. She was making, um, Dern swing and miss very wildly. And so I just thought it, the way everything looked, I would give it to Lemos. And I think that was the round that was in question. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that when Dern took her down, there wasn't enough striking or damage. It was it was control time. It was well done. It was a nice takedown. But it just didn't outweigh what Lemos did in the first round. And she also had a nice reversal towards the end of that round. Mm-hmm. Like j- It was like the last 30 seconds, but she still got on top. So I think that that just solidified with the damage and then just being able to reverse and stay safe. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that's what stole the round. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a funny because uh, most people gave it 29, 27 to Lemos. And that's because that second round Mm. was so nasty. You said she uh, reacted kind of badly there and she did. I thought they were going to stop it. 
the way I she was, grabbed her face is like you were talking about um, before. She grabbed her face like something got broke. And it looks like it might have been. Yeah. Luckily, she's home, so she doesn't have to worry about flying or yeah. anything if it's an or, or, orbital f- fracture. But even if it's just like a cartilage or something, you hear that, you feel that crunch it, and the pain. Painful. Yeah, the pain is just nasty. So, um, yeah, that, even though Dern was able to kind of turn it around at the very end, get on top and just threaten stuff and stay alive at the end of that second round, um, it was still a 10 8 in a lot of people's books. Yeah, and, and I don't the think they're scores. wrong for that. Yeah. Yeah. What was it on the actual scorecards? On the actual scorecard, it was um, 29 28, all three. Yeah. And same rounds that we thought. Two for second or first and second to Lemos and third to Dern. No, I, I agree with it. I mean, it, w- it was a great fight. It was, it was a valiant effort from Dern trying to come back from, you know, being you know rocked or or injured you know she still really tried to dog it out which I appreciate but I just think that Lemos was was granted the win and I think she deserved it yeah for sure she deserved that one (laughs) we won't talk about that we she deserved that one um yeah any other fights you want to chat about um, I think that we should actually step over to our exclusive content and continue this conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. let's do that then. We'll see, see you guys on the other side. <laughs>